Somebody said the other day that there was a greater wealth below water throughout the world than there was on dry land. I take it that they meant mineral wealth, but there's certainly still a lot of treasure. Well, this bygone special goes to Arlsey near Baldock to see the raising of one piece of treasure. This, in case you didn't know, is what our grandfathers knew as a steam navy. In 1909, this one was the very latest model, fresh from the manufacturers in Lincoln. A navy was a digger, a large steam-powered crane and bucket that could do the work of a thousand men without complaint or fatigue. They hissed and puffed and clanked and dug in every open pit and quarry in the country. Ruston and Proctor of Lincoln was one famous firm which built navvies in all shapes and sizes. Theirs were reliable and built to last for up to 20 years of hard service. But one, a 12-ton steam crane navvy, did somewhat better than that. When, in 1902, Edward VII gave Ruston's works the seal of approval, our navvy was not yet born. It was just a draftsman's sketch on a paper. Well, that was just memories from 70 years ago, but our navvy lived, worked and was finally abandoned to the rising water here at Alsey in Bedfordshire. Drowned, but certainly not forgotten. Yeah. And which one is you? Ray Hooley, that's him on the left, wanted that digger back in working order just as it was when George Alban last worked in 1931. There's George. Right near the Navy. I started work on the machine was in the water in January 1918. Yeah, and I worked see. on it quite a long time. And then we used to change over. I used to go on uh, the top road Navy a week. And then on the bottom one for a week, we used to change about. It took Ray Hooley two years to plan his rescue scheme which started with a thorough inspection to see if it was really worthwhile. There were plenty of volunteers, especially for the underwater work, but that can be dangerous and Ray couldn't afford mistakes, so he finally chose the Bedford Subaqua Club, simply because they were so safety conscious they wouldn't even let him go down for a peep. Perhaps the most extraordinary thing was the clarity of the water. It was like best gin, until disturbed. So clear that the subaqua boys had little difficulty giving our navvy the once over. You're never going to see where to put the spanners because as soon as you touch it, all the visibility goes. So as soon as you touch the thing, yeah. it's just gone. What's it like for weed? Is it covered oh, in weed? It's not too bad. It's just all the sediment all over it. It's so sort of. Yeah, you're going to put a spanner on it, you won't even see where the spanner's gone. That'll be the problem. I think we'll cope there. Yeah. The chemical composition of this chalky water had prevented rust from forming. Instead, it was covered with a layer of sediment and freshwater mussels. They reckoned the old lady was worth saving. From then on, it was all go. You can't just pluck 45 tonnes of steel straight out of 18 feet of water. You have to use ingenuity. First of all, the bucket had to come off, which meant lifting the weight of the jib, that long bit sticking out of the water. The first cable goes around the bucket arm to be pulled away later, once the main pin is removed. It's hard to explain when you can't see it, but it gets clearer as things progress. Nothing could really happen until the bracket holding the bucket arm was knocked off, so separating three tons of bucket from the rest of the machine. 
Another cable was then fixed to the main jib, whose original support had been twisted steel and hemp cord ropes, which not surprisingly had rotted away. Over on the left, you can just see the boiler poking out. Next to arrive was King Kong, the diamond tea recovery tractor from New Malden, usually seen stalking breakdowns on the M1 motorway. Team talk time, lads. We can't risk that. If what I want you to do tie on, tie on now, OK? Yeah. Just take the strain, yeah. yes. pull it a little bit and just get the feel of it. We want yeah. to see what happens, OK? Yes. yes. So you've actually still got the pin in the bottom bucket. Yeah. yeah. Bottom of that. yeah. yeah. Are you going to remove that? Yeah. 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 Throw it over, mate. All right. By now, there were plenty of willing hands down at the Blue Lagoon, all wanting to help. King Kong winched up the slap to try and pull out the main jib. <laughs> There was no telling just how much tension it would take. Such a powerful machine could easily bend or snap vital parts of the precious relic. All that was needed was for the weight to be taken off the bucket underneath, but no more. It was all done by guesswork, bit by bit. They got it just right. After clearing off the unexpected debris, the main pin was ready for removal, followed by unbolting the jib from the swivelling part of the navy. That done, the jib could be lowered delicately onto the bottom for recovery later on. Another couple of tons removed. That was the first time the jib end had actually been under the water in its life. The famous Blue Lagoon monster had apparently disappeared. The third part to remove was the boiler. Easy. Things had gone so well up to now that boilers know a thing or two about resisting pressure. Dismantling was finally completed. Now it had to be lifted. A fairly large crane was on its way, so large, they said, that it needed its own road down to the water's edge. Such was the interest generated by the proceedings at Arlsey Pit that a friendly road builder sent along his biggest scraper. The job was done in no time at all. All the bags together, please. Yeah, In the meantime, specialists of a different sort of lifting had arrived. A marine salvage company from Holt in Norfolk have modernised an ancient means of raising treasures from the deep. Their equipment looked more like a hot air balloonist meeting, and so it might, as balloons are exactly what they do use. A trick originally devised for salvaging cannon from galleons on the seabed. This operation can be extremely dangerous and had to be tackled by the firm's own highly experienced divers. We'll put two five-ton bags around these wheels, around the axle of the wheel, mm -hmm. which means you've got to dig away all the muck and stuff there. The floating buoys mark the position of the air pipes so that they won't be crushed when the time comes to haul in our navy. They took down hooks and lines and folded airbags, still uninflated, and attached them at eight separate points as low down on the main frame as possible. Each single steel cable had a braking strain of ten tons. Broad webbing straps go over and around the balloons. The attachment of each balloon is critical if the massive bulk is to remain stable. If it should tilt, there could be serious trouble. Once all the air pipes were in position and the bags secure, the air compressor was started. 
the open bottom balloons filled up in only a couple of minutes. Although the air was pumped in at 100 pounds per square inch, the balloons needed volume, not pressure. Each contains 175 cubic feet at only seven pounds per square inch. Each 10 foot long bag can potentially raise five tons when submerged. But in only 18 feet of water, no sooner are they lifting than they start to appear above the surface, so losing their lift. But in this case, the requirement was not to raise the navy to the surface, merely to get it off the bottom. 12 inches of clearance is quite enough to remove friction so long as the whole platform is kept level and doesn't drag. At that moment, the crane arrived. All 65 tonnes of it. It looked straight out of Star Wars. It was the newest mobile crane in the country. It had already won itself a design award, but this was its first real job. This was the young stretching out to help the old. And it was all hands to the rope. The navvy was so perfectly balanced that hauling it into shallow water was almost effortless. The extended crane towered 90 feet over the scene like a giant heron watching the water. Quite a crowd gathered on the bank. This was fishing on a scale not often seen. And then, there she was. Just a glimpse of the monster from the Blue Lagoon. The first time above water for nearly 50 years. Somehow it looked about as unlike a steam navvy as anything could, just a heap of junk. But what jubilation the team felt, whatever it looked like, oh, sweet success. That was a close shave. Fortunately, no damage was done, either to any of the men or, more important, to our dear old navvy. Everyone was delighted and excited, but perhaps the most amazed and incredulous of the lot was George Alban, the last driver. I never thought I'd do it. I think it's really marvellous. Never thought I'd see it again anyway. They're like bees around a honeypot. Strange, isn't it, how grown men get so excited over old iron? But they'd worked hard, all of them. The divers, King Kong, the crane, the road builder, the balloon boys, and all the extra helpers under Ray's direction. <laughs> That's only half the story. The real job had yet to begin. Nobody wants a digger in that state, however much effort they've put into getting it. She was going home now, back to her birthplace in Lincoln, where she was built in 1909. The boiler went to Roby's, the firm which built it, where the experts made their initial inspection. Well, uh, for me, as a layman, after 45 years in the water, the condition of this boiler looks very sound. What does it look like to a boiler man? Very good. What about, what about the rust on it? Is it well, very I don't deep? think that's important at all. There's no surface corrosion on the outside of the shell. Mm -hmm. So she'll stand a boiler test, yes, you reckon? Yes, I hope so. What sort of pressure will she stand? About 80 pounds of the scale. <laughs> it was the job of the apprentices at Rust and View Cyrus to strip down and clean up the whole sad hulk. But what a treat that was for them. They certainly relish such a worthwhile task. They queued up for the chance to work on steam, just like their grandpas used to. Well, yes. A great surge of fond interest swept through the firm. The old were reminded of their youth, 
The young wanted to learn from the past. We've no particulars of the fittings uh, on the job, but we have found uh, a drawing here of an old roby door, uh, which is similar as shown in the catalogue, yes. and, uh, and of the same date. Despite the remarkable state of preservation, there were many small parts which had to be repaired and even rebuilt. Remember that when she was left in the chalk pit at Arlsey, she'd already worked hard for 22 years and was considered clapped out then. Piecing her together would take three years from start to finish. Without a proper blueprint, each component was arranged jigsaw fashion on the floor of the training workshop. Down at Roby's, the boiler had been thoroughly sandblasted until it shone like new. This was the most vulnerable piece of the whole machine and the most likely to need replacing, something nobody wished to do. Ray found that the wooden brake shoes had suffered little from the water, but for safety's sake, half were replaced in Elm, the original wood. After three months, most of the engine was ready for trials, not with steam, of course, but with compressed air. It really did seem quite fantastic that these parts were working in such good order after so many years underwater. The larger bits of our navy had to be kept outside for lack of space. There was a lot of work restoring tired and worn parts. The jib and the wheels had clearly been overworked in their time. The wheels were no longer quite round and the axle was bent. The result of an accident George Alban remembered happening in the 1920s. Amazingly, the boiler was standing up to the most rigorous tests at Roby's. Well, Ray, this is the crunch. This ultrasonic test should tell us whether the boiler is going to be usable or not. These boilers have a bad record. Uh, the design is old, and uh, several years ago we had one or two failures boilers of this kind. Yes. It is now mandatory that the, all of these boilers on the lap seams, the vertical lap seams, the ultrasonic checks. Oh. There are strict laws governing the working strength of new boilers, let alone old ones. The inspector was most interested to see if ours could pass the test. The thickness of the metal was examined electronically for defects. Two years had now passed and every piece, large and small, was repaired and awaiting reconstruction. But would they fit together? This was by no means certain, as there was no original plan to work from. Some of the parts of steam navvies were built from cast iron and joined together by rivets, but today repairs were made using the finest steel and modern welding techniques. Before the working attachments were replaced, the apprentices held their own trials of the two engines and the turntable, powered by compressed air. So far, so good. Now to add the jib. They had been a bit worried about the strength of the jib at the point where it used to poke above the waterline in the pit. Fifty years of wet and dry on the same few inches should have eaten great rust pits. 
but beneath a protective layer of freshwater mussels, there wasn't a mark to be seen. Built into the ribbing was the steam ram cylinder, the main power pack, which gave the bucket its digging stroke. And all that holds it on is that main pin, the first piece removed underwater right back at the start of the operation. The boiler had now passed the most meticulous examinations under high pressure and proved to be as strong today as the last time it left Roby's yard 70 years ago. Our 12-ton steam crane navvy was nearly whole again, the pride of all who had worked so hard to get it this far. A second undercoat of paint gave her that nearly new look. For everyone, of all ages, this was a rare sight. This was an exercise unlikely to be repeated in their lifetime. Once the boiler was on, it would be truly complete in appearance. Like Cinderella before the ball. But would it work again? The idea was to get it back to a quarry for the final challenge. Digging. <laughs> Nearly three years from the start of the whole project came the day of the first stoker. It was a thrilling moment. The old smells of coal and steam filled the air. Frankenstein's monster, life returning to the beast once more. Though there are a handful of steam navvies still working in the world, none are as old or important as this one. George Alban took a great step back in time when he held those controls. Just look at him. I must say, I'm now seeing it, it's a marvellous job. I've never seen it look as good as this. Never since I remember it. That's 1918 when I first went on it. I've never seen it look like this before. The inspector had given the boiler a maximum working pressure of 80 pounds per square inch, so the safety valve was set to blow once full steam was achieved. engines turned within, the crankshaft wheels spun at the same speed. The two engines perform three functions. First, to raise and lower the jib and bucket. This is it. It works. Second, to swing the turntable in either direction. Carrying both the weight of the machine and a full load, a total of some 45 tonnes. And third, to propel the whole navvy along its tracks. Everything worked perfectly. Until suddenly the wheels bearing the turntable jammed. The marriage between modern welding and cast iron had broken down. More cracks appeared. This time in the turntable itself. Cracks that ran right through the base. Oh, despite all the work of restoration. Despite modern technology. Our grand old lady just couldn't quite make it.
Well, there we are. That's one of the hazards of renovating obsolete machinery, particularly if it's been that long underwater. But I'm certain those chaps will turn to and get it right in the end.